Um, but thank you very much for coming on such a beautiful day. Um, ICA Quickfires are impromptu talks programmed um, in response to a prominent artist visiting London or in response to current debates. So we're really delighted to be um, uh, with Thomas Halsigo today, a sculptor who's based um, in, in our lay. Um, he's uh, recently opened uh, three exhibitions at Hauser and Worth, <coughs> The Mess I'm Looking For, I'll Be Your Sister, and Special Brew um, that are showing in both London and Switzerland until the 20th and 27th of October. Um, his work has been shown extensively worldwide, such as at the Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts last year, Modern Art Oxford um, in 2010, the Modern Institute in Glasgow in 2007, and many, many more. Um, he'll be in conversation with Michael Stanley, who's Director of Modern Art Oxford, one of the country's leading venues for international contemporary art. Um, Michael has previously worked as Director of Milton Keynes Gallery, and as a curator at Birmingham's Icon Gallery. So thank you very much to our speakers for being here with us today. Um, they'll be um, discussing Thomas's most recent work and then we'll open up for some questions from you. So once again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you to our speakers. And I'll hand over to Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear okay? Sound is good. Okay, we're in these um, quite crazy chairs as well. And I think, I think the aim is just to relax as much as you can. So you can't hear us Bring anymore. Bring the microphone with you, Mike. <clears throat> but uh, it's, uh, thank you very much, um, Deborah. It's a, it's a huge um, pleasure to to be here um, for us both to be yes. here, actually. And um, Isaac. Yes. Turn of events. <laughs> um, what what we'd like to do today? Obviously, Thomas opens with um, his two uh, major exhibitions at House and Worth in in London, and. Um, and it's something which actually we do want to uh, pick up and, and talk about, as well as that relationship um, back to London and, and back to here. Yeah. Um, and I, just through the course of the talk, want to talk both about your uh, commitment or relationship back to, to the UK and what that means to you, but also, um, I think, to I take you on a bit of a journey as well. Okay. I feel it's like that Michael Parkinson yeah, moment with and the um, with the Red Book and everything. Um, okay. But I think as, as it is, you know, such a moment in terms of um, your career and where you are, I think it's actually quite fitting to do that. Okay. Um, and it is a, a biography, which is a, an incredible biography, um, and one that touches on London and, and comes back uh, through, through a whole journey. Um, I want to talk about what's happened over the last five years. Um, I want to talk about the studio, and I want to talk about the, the process of making as well, because I think uh, if anything comes through uh, this recent passage of work, it's um, the intensity with which that production has come through, certainly over the last um, five years or so. And then certainly uh, some time at the end to talk about these two positions um, at, at Housen Worth, which I do see as very strong positions, as you will very much say. Um, Paul Nesbitt texted me before and I asked him, what opening question should I ask Thomas? Uh, and he said, how do you get away with putting two fingers up to Savile Row and a big dick in the window? <laughs> and um, it, it won't be the opening question, um, but it might I be something. I can answer that one. <laughs> That's the only one I can answer. <clears throat> but, um, but touching on that, and uh, I mean, I, I know you so well, Thomas, in a way, and we, 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 we've had many years together, but, and I know the importance of this show in London yeah. for you, but I, w I wanted to ask um, the importance of London um, for the work, you know, the context for yeah. the work. Um, I did a staff, a staff walk through. Well, one of the great things about the gallery was they asked me to talk about the show to the staff of the gallery, which was an interesting thing, and it caught me a little bit uh, un <laughs> unaware, and I spoke too frankly about it because I wasn't guarded, I wasn't... Uh, in a strong mood, we were finishing the creation, and so because of that, I could speak quite frankly about it, which was um, uh, there was a, Los Angeles is number one, uh, a long, long way away physically, you know, mm. in terms of light, city, the way you live your life, you know, the class system, the whole shebang, and yet 
uh, when I accepted the show uh, uh, in House and Wolf, because it was through Swiss people, it didn't hit me for a while that it was in London, weirdly enough, because mm. I've been so zero, you know, they're so Swiss. House and Wolf, the gallery, and, and um, so uh, I realized as, as I started working on the show and as I started to really, um, you know, struggle with it in an unusual way, because I'd been through those three or four years that we could do where, you know, it was like, bah, 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 you know, and everything kind of flowed and, and uh, there was that kind of American, you know, kind of roller coaster, woo, you know, doing eight shows in a year and stuff like that. And, and this show I really took on thinking I could do that. And I got, it was like going to quicksand. It was like getting lost. I mean, it was like being, thinking you know a neighborhood and then finding your completely lost, you know. What, your, your experience of putting this show together? Yeah, yeah. no, I'm talking about, first of all, in, in terms of in the studio of the psychology. Mm. And I realized at that moment that England was very, very present. Even though I am 8,000 miles or whatever mm. it is, I began to notice that my dialogue in my head, when I was working, which I've ignored for a long time, I started to notice during the making of the show. And I began to uh, notice on, on a psychological level that I began to find it very difficult to finish anything. I found it very difficult to, you, you know, you guys, if there's any artists in the room, you might be familiar with this feeling. You just can't finish, you know, anything and you can't, you don't know how to and you wonder and you get into this kind of um, sort of like... Uh, wandering in the desert kind of cosmic thing. So that was very troubling, you know, because people kept being like, how's the show coming? And are you on schedule? And I'm like, I've got half a penis in here and <laughs> I feel depressed. So yeah, it's going good. And, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and the, 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 the penis columns I was making, which I made six for the show, we only were able to show three. Mm the government of, of the UK wouldn't allow that much Freudian <laughs> tension into the show. But uh, they, mm. you know, and, and I had this layer of things, you know, if you've ever been really drunk, as you're getting drunk, you think, I'm aware of how weird I'm being now. I'm drunk and I'm being weird. And then uh, as you get further drunk, you, you think, I'm still aware of how weird I'm being, blah, blah, blah. But the behavior gets really weirder and weirder and mm. weirder and weirder. And you drift further out to sea, let's say, mm. till the next morning you're going, what was I doing? This show was a lot like that. I thought I was in control of it. I kept being like, yep, this is mm. coming together, da, da, da. And uh, I couldn't do, you know, I, I stopped accepting other things. I stopped being able to, you know, I got into this. And at one moment, uh, you know, Amy, you know, my wife pointed out, you know, and I kept being like, what's wrong with me? Mm. What's going on? And she said, well, do you think it's, you know, because it's the UK? And it was like, Ooh, you know. And uh, so, so, yes, it was a very unusual period of work. Mm. And, um, and it was a very hard show. Mm. I regretted it, uh, uh, doing it a lot. Because, uh, and I uh, frequently said, I'm not doing this anymore. I just won't do these kind of things. It's too painful, da, da, da. I can't stand it. And, uh, yeah, I was working with a really ferocious intensity. Like, if you see the shows, that, that Zurich was added at the last mm. moment just because, you know, there wasn't room. Mm. And, and then there's about three times as much mm. work as in the shows in the studio in L.A. Like, it was a complete overshoot, you know, mm. of the mark. So all this behavior was, was uh, you know, undoubtedly but linked hasn't to... Hasn't that been a way in, in which you've just worked there over the last five years? You know, in terms of just the... Mm the sheer amount and immensity but there's an American side of my character you know I travel with two passports now mm. I have a UK and I have an American so there is an American side to my persona that can be very pragmatic in that American way of saying you know what you know boom that's the deadline mm. da, 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 da. and then there's a UK side to my persona or a Leeds side mm. to my persona that's like, oh, that's the deadline? Fuck you, I'm not doing that mm. deadline, you motherfucker. Mm. You're going to put that deadline on me. I'm going to ruin the deadline. And the Americans going, Thomas, you accepted the deadline, do you remember? Mm. That's how we're going to get paid on that. And I'm going, no, <laughs> won't do it. So that, uh, the 
there's those two characters and n neither really won. I think the American persona finally won on this show mm. because there's a show and because I, mm. I you know, the, the, you know, we installed it and, you know, we, we did it. But the, the Leeds persona was very, yeah. very present the whole time, trying when, to ruin it pretty much. When did you get the American passport? Is that quite new? Like nine days ago. Carolyn really? can probably tell you, like ten days ago. And just to let you know, it's an amazing thing. You're in a room with 6,000 people at the LA Convention Center. They write you a letter and say, this is a very holy event or a very intense mm. event. Da, da, da. The month before, they've held the uh, pornography uh, convention at the same place, which in LA, you can imagine what that's like. And then Obama comes up on a giant video screen and kind of swears you in. And mm. uh, it works. Yeah. You start crying and you wave a flag. And <laughs> <laughs> just to let you know, they really know. I mean, the Disney experience, they can make that. <laughs> swearing in. And I was mm. about, uh, I was probably the only redhead in about an eight mile <laughs> radius of that event. But uh, mm. yeah, I know. I know um, so yeah, the two, the two characters in the show, you can see them bouncing yeah. round off of each other. And you, I mean, you, um, you know, you jest a little bit on, on Disney there, and um, mm -hmm. and we are going to talk through almost the next, the last twenty years as, yeah. as well, if you like, from yeah. uh, the early nineties here, yeah. um, St. Martin's, and yeah. then you you got out of here quite quickly, though. You know, at a uh, time when there was a hell of a lot going on here, yeah, you made I, quite I, a conscious I, decision not to be here. Yeah, well, um, no, the, the the city of London took quite a conscious decision that I shouldn't be there. It was the other way around. In 19, you know, I came to London in 1990, whatever, 91 or 1990. Uh, it should be pointed out, uh, you know, there was no YBA, there was no White Cube, mm. there was no, there was Cork Street. You know, mm. you went to Anthony DeFay on a Friday night, and uh, there wasn't free drinks. You know, it was a weird thing. And uh, I was said that Anthony DeFay did, did amazing. I saw my first really great, you know, Keith for show, mm. my first great Carl Andre, my first great boy show. Mm. But um, uh, St. Martin's was the wrong place to go. It was already kind of, if you were smart, you'd go to Goldsmiths. It was kind of, though no one really mm. knew, it was like Chelsea or Goldsmiths, but definitely not Well, that St. was already Martin's. in the ether then. Yeah, it was sort of, a friend of mine got into Goldsmiths and... Uh, and uh, we were sort of picking things out of a hat in Leeds, you know, when you're at Jacob Crayman Leeds and the guy in the studio next to you is a former armed robber who blew his hand off during a heist. <laughs> Believe me, you know that that guy's not going, I think Michael Craig Martin is going to open up a very interesting <laughs> discussion. So we, it was kind of a random thing. And uh, so when I, when I got to St. Martin's, um, it was amazing, but I was so terrified and I was so unprepared. And but were you, were you thinking that? You know, when you moved down from Leeds, were you thinking Michael Craig Martin's going to open up my world? No. Or were you no, just thinking... No, I didn't know. I mean, Damien Hurst obviously is from Leeds and was about five years older than me. So there were stories about Damien at my foundation course, okay. which Margaret Thatcher forced you to go to, mm. to, to try to convince you not to be an yeah. artist. They kept being like, do you feel like designing toilet paper, Thomas? I'd be like, what? You know, it was all to remember. It was towards <coughs> designing things. Everything was designing things. So Damien was, was, was famous for like leaping off things and taking enormous amounts of drugs and uh, setting fire mm. to things. And I sort of followed in that lineage at mm. that time. So people were like, mm, you're kind of like Damien. You know, you set fire to the roof. You, you know, done this. That was Jacob Kramer. It was, you were, you mm. were famous for... for for the sort of craziness of your behavior, you know. So, uh, but, but when I got to London, um, uh, St. Martin's was, was like a freak show kind of a place, you know, and I, I, I wasn't sure if I was in painting or sculpture, because I didn't love performance. That was my mm. thing was performance art. Uh, I don't know how I came up with that idea. I have no idea. I still, I think probably from Joseph Boyce or a book someone gave me about Chris Burden, mm. He shot himself, I thought that kind of sounded <laughs> right for me. <clears throat> and um, so I was a performance artist. And this is the odd thing that's happening now in London. It's very interesting, I think. Uh, and happening in the world, generally, sort of speaking, is uh, what's up is down, what's down is mm. up. You know, every, no one really knows what to do with the 20th century. No one really knows mm. what, where to pinpoint the avant-garde anymore. Mm. 
And, um, and I was lucky enough coming out of Leeds that, that I didn't have any of that sort of Greenbergian indexing. You mm. do this, then this, then you lead to this. That leads to abstraction, da 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 I just didn't care. You know, I took it from wherever, you know, that interested me. And uh, so, yeah, I arrived at St. Martin's wondering if I was going to be on a performance mm. course, you know. And the first day they had a sand pit in the middle of the room. Uh, I mean, a sand pit, a large sand pit. And a guy called Prevera, who was from the Shanks family, as in toilet bowls. So, some money in that family. Mm. And he'd become Prevera, who dressed in all orange. Uh, he was like 70 years old and dressed in orange. And he said, I think you spent a couple of uh, days, maybe a week, just playing in the sand, sand pit. And I was sort of like, yeah. Uh, you know, and so for me, that was London, you know, mm -hmm. London was, you know, I was on the seventh floor of St. Martin's in the sand pit, like with Enrico David, if he's here, he'll remember it, and, you know, sort of just going, wow, the mm. South is really weird, you know, like, and I got a full grant, you know, I was paid to come here, you know, which doesn't exist anymore, because I was from a single parent family mm. in, in Leeds, so, so, uh, but you know, I had no concept of, you know, the, the idea that you would sell work or be successful or anything. It was a Dickensian mm. atmosphere. St. Martin's Charing Cross Road was falling mm. to bits. Uh, you know, the fashion school was where it was at, you know, and, um, and you know, all the fashion students walked through the sculpture department and kind of ripped us off, and we were all like happy to be ripped off by like Alexander McQueen or whoever mm. it was walking through, which who was mm. there at the time. But the art thing wasn't a big deal like it is now. And the idea of conceptual art or abstraction or performance, or, it didn't, it was just all, mm. no one knew anything. Mm. You know, that was my feeling. But I certainly didn't like you know, draw from the nude or was encouraged to make, mm. I was encouraged to make far out, mm. you know, expanded, you know, field. Yeah, my parents' generation. But did even some of that, um, I mean, because I was aware that you, you, you did a, a hell of a lot of performance early on, mm. but is that, you know, quite bluntly a very direct link into the figurative work that you moved into? into the well, body? yeah, my, my big, let's say, catalyst moment was always voice. And it mm. has been on, I mean, it's one of those artists that has remained really important for me it, it, periodically, you know, every six years you kind of, come back to, to that. But he had this, you know, thinking his form, these mm. ideas, or science of Duchamp is overrated, or these things, uh, talking to a dead hair. I think coming from the North, which has this very romantic, mm. very essential culture, I mean, let's, let's face it, uh, that appealed to me, you know, the idea of action, not, you know, uh, and the idea of, and that, uh, I saw Boyce you know, first as a performance artist and then as a sculptor, really. And uh, that led me to look at Mike Kelly as a sculptor, mm. you know. And I, I had the chance to meet Mike Kelly, and Mike, Mike Kelly told me, you know, I'm a really formal sculptor. Mm. You know, people really misunderstand and think I'm some sort of demented pop artist. I'm not. I really believe in the Boisean idea of thinking mm. is form, which is, you know, the great. So I, I was coming out of that, that mm. idea. And uh, at, at London at that time, you know, I met a lot of freaks in that course, which was, you know, Enrico was a complete freak, you know, from Italy. And, uh, and I'm in a serious freak. I'm not talking about, you know, sort of saying, you know, he worked at, he was like a barman at the fridge in, in Brixton, and he was sort of, into, he kept telling me, I mean, I'm really into Sean Connery, you know, and he was making these <laughs> things, and I was making these things. And you'd, I'd have that moment periodically with St. Mines at the time where, like, wow, this is not going to go well. Mm. You know, this is awful, what we're doing here. But it was kind of dynamic also. It's Chloe Stewart, who's mm. here, you know. We were kind of a group of freaks, mm. and there wasn't much pressure. And, um, and slowly but surely, the, the logical step from performance felt to me that uh, it struck me that when you make something, it was an idea I had pretty early, it, there's a sort of performance that goes into mm. that. And I like that transmission from, from, from into this material that then you left alone, you stopped, and it, this object remained. That, that coming from the background I came from fascinated me. Mm. Like, wow, that, I don't have to do anything anymore. It's just there. When you say the background, what do you mean by that? Uh, Biographic 
directly or from your, from yeah. your artistic background? Yeah, my, my artistic background and, uh, you know, because where I came, you know, the, the situation there was you'd make something, you'd destroy it instantly. You'd photograph it and destroy it. Again, there was no real market for no. things. And nobody, I mean, sculpture didn't, I mean, people think I had this super traditional uh, art school. Yeah, I guess you were drawing from the nude and making things. Mm. We weren't. We, we were encouraged to make... Uh, to, to, you know, texts. Mm. That was, you know, that was the thing. Critical fine art practice. CFAM mm. was the, the hot shit. Mm. So we were, uh, you know, I was... There was no real sort of background other than maybe subliminally in, in the North this feeling of the objectness of things and the physicality mm. of things and the, and the, and the architecture there mm. and, and the, these things. But, you know, I didn't know about really about Henry Moore at that time. Being from Leeds, I didn't really know about you know, the architecture about the, mm. the history of industry. I didn't know these things. I, they were kind well, of, even, even then, after being in London and then moving no, to the Italians? No. I discovered mm. Henry Moore through Aaron Curry, who's a Texan who I met in Los Angeles, who was like, these look like, yeah. you know, Star Wars stuff. They're crazy. Yeah. And I started thinking, yeah, you know, I didn't find Henry Moore at that, at that time mm. at all. It was mm. always boys. It was always... And, uh, but then when you look later, you know, you realize Boyce was a big, big, big fan of Lembrucker, mm. a big, big fan of Rodin. If you look at the drawings, they have an enormous, he believed Rodin was the, the great sculptor of human energy. So, you know, and of, of transmission of energy. And, uh, but, you know, the stirrings then were, were, were very rudimentary. Mm. All I knew was that it was really upsetting everybody, uh, that it wasn't, um, it didn't look like it had much future, and so and, and so London already then was kind of feeling like a very very hostile place to me. My degree show with, with me and Enrico did it together, and we thought you know we thought wow we're gonna just like blow everyone's mind with this show you know and I think like three people turned up my mother and a couple of my friends mm. and they were all disappointed and mm. we were like whoa you know and uh, so. Um, so I, I, yeah, I was looking for any way out. I mean, I was looking for any, yeah, I and just that, didn't want to take a job. And that way out was at Atelier's. And it's yeah. interesting, um, Thomas Schutter opens this week, Serpentine at Frith Street, and right. Marlena Dumas, who was there. But right. I was always interested when we'd spoken yeah. um, that Stanley Brown was quite a big influence. Yeah, Stanley there. Brown was, uh, so I had a couple of friends who were sort of uh, academically ex uh, interested in fluxus and stuff, and, and they said, well, you know, I got into the Italians, uh, that was also insane. I mean, uh, I don't know how that happened. I mean, I applied, I remember I sent a wood box, because I didn't know if you were sending slides, remember slides? If you were sending slides, I thought they'd get down, so I sent a wood, a, an old wood box I bought in Brick Lane, you know, so there must have been in Amsterdam, like, what's the guy with the wood box? <laughs> I was so stupid, mm. and, uh, but I got in, and People kept telling me, oh, Stanley Brown's going to make mince me of you, you know, intellectual, you know, just like this northern complete monster, you know. And Stanley Brown walks in and uh, uh, puts his bag, he always travelled with, he travelled almost constantly, obsessively constantly. And, uh, you know, very few people know, uh, you know, Stanley's half Dutch, half Suriname, so he's, he's, he's this uh, guy from Suriname. And I, you know, I just didn't, didn't recognize it. I had this image of a crusty sort of Dan Graham type of a guy who would make that work. And he put this giant green bag down and he said, well, I, you know, uh, I had it on at Coleman on, because I was trying to be, you know. And he said, yeah, tomorrow is the question. And then the next week, didn't say anything, left his bag in my studio all week, which was like, what is this? <laughs> And then came back with an album cover of, you know, Don Cherry on it, come tomorrow is the question, and like handed it to me. He said, you need to put that on the bookshelf. I said, oh, I agree, you know. And uh, from that moment on, you know, I feel like in many ways, um, you know, his image of sculpture was very close to my image of sculpture, which is, you know, it comes out of an action, a need to act. Uh, it comes out of a frustration of, you know, your, your, your social and political reality. Mm. It comes out of a frustration with other forms of expression. And it comes out with a, with a, with a, it comes out for the need to be 
deal with some kind of sublime cosmic sense mm. of what you are. He always said when you make any kind of object, and he included moving a glass, he would call that a sculpture, you affected every other particle in the universe. And so he'd say, you know, every time you make a move, be careful because it cascades through the universe. And that, you know, really struck me mm. that, uh, you know, ooh, wow, you know. So that, that's, he, he came from a very, very romantic, uh, very positive sort of group, you know. Mm. I had much more trouble with the artists that work kind of could have looked like mine, let's say, you know. I got more, much more, more peers in a way. Yeah, more, more peers mm. or, yeah. Stanley always said, you know, you've got to get rid of us baby mm. boomers. We're like ruining everything, mm. you know. That was his thing. We're terrible, you know, get rid of us, you know, do something else. And he said, why is everyone doing all the stuff? We did it in the 60s, you should stop doing it, you know. So he came from that, which was mm. a very generous father figure, let's mm. say. That wasn't the father, you do this. He was a very, very interesting guy. Mm. And I thought we'd be friends after I left. And then I said, can I have your address? And, da, da, da. and he gave me a fake address, gave me a fake number. <laughs> I never, ever reached him again, mm. you know. And I've been trying for the last three years to do a show with him, and this is like, I could get like, uh, you know, Dick Cheney on the line faster than you can get Stanley. So, uh, but he left me with this huge legacy, and I think about it all the time. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's kind of going on in my mind all mm. the time. And at the time, we've got some kind of images behind yes. you. I went louder then. Um, not there. Uh, that's Belgium. This is Belgium. Yeah, that's Italian. And that's the Italians. Yeah. And was this, was this work that you made there in yeah. Amsterdam rather than, um, you know, there's no baggage of this that came from London at all? No. In London, uh, I'd sort of, um, I'd started to, uh, you know, I, I, I was interested in the response. I, I was fascinated. I, I, I've never, I, I was just watching No Direction Helms because he's thinking about Bob Dylan. Mm. And when he went electric at, at, the, at the folk festival, I can't remember the one, everyone booed and they wanted to cut the thing. And he's talking about it, and you can see the relish he has in this. Uh, you know, he presents it like he didn't mean it, but, you know, he kind of liked, you know, playing these songs, you know. And I've always liked, I, I, I never like applause very much, you know. It, it doesn't feel like it's a very creative thing. When people say, oh, I really like it, you know, da, da, da. And so, when, as soon as they started making these things, you know, everyone kept saying, you really have to stop, you know, there's no future, just stop doing this. And uh, I, you know, the lead mm. quality of me was going, wow, why are they saying this? You know, because what does that mean? Or mm. what are they trying to push me towards or whatever? So, um, that was more reactive, that was more sort of class-based, that was more socially based. But then when I went to Amsterdam, you could just see that, you know, the size of the studios you got in Amsterdam was so huge. Mm. And you had a, your own key, I mean, you could lock the door and just be in this giant room. And uh, then, that was when, you know, let's say the acid kicked in, you know, and I had been dabbling with this thing and then, boom, you know, this kind of psychedelic mm. uh, thing happened that I attribute now to, as just to a release, to a sensual, visual release that I couldn't have in England. You know, because England was so left brain for me and it was so traumatic for me that, you know, all these images and colours and shapes and touches and kind of mm. flow ebbed out mm. of me like one of these kind of... And at the time, a lot of these sculptures were coloured, pigmented. All very, very coloured, yeah. Everything was brightly, brightly coloured. You know, it was like bright yellow, bright mm. blue, bright red. You know, everything was, um, you know, extremely... And, um, you know, I sort of saw them like they were these pop things, mm. you know. And, um, and, and it was really uncontrollable. I've never had a period like that. Even working on the house show, it wasn't like that. Mm. This, that was like without control, you mm. know, and, 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 uh, and, um, and really, want, you know, really not uh, like hating everything I made, you mm. know, but then having to make it, sort mm. of looking at a car crash kind of a feeling, like, what am I doing, you know, what am I doing? But, you know, the Italians was unique in that, you know, you had nine artists. They turned up every Tuesday and 
all critics or thinkers, and the, these were all incredible people, even the people I didn't agree with. They were an extraordinary group at that time, between what was it, 94 and 96. I mean, this is, this, like, is, uh, was an astonishing Incredible. group of people. So I was in really lucky, I was really fortunate, mm. I sort of landed mm. in these group of people. So they kind of were guiding me through it. You know, mm. Diane Dibbitz, uh, you know, Tom mm. Shooter, like yeah, you say. Yeah, and Tom Shooter mm. was known at that moment mainly for the little, you know, mm. the, the little wax um, things. And, and then there were these great people, you know, Amy, Matthew mm. Monaghan, was Fisher, you know, just been thrown out or whatever happened to him. I don't know, was he thrown out? Chris, can you tell us if you're here? I think he was thrown out, yeah. Yeah, he was thrown out. And, and so, you know, there, there was a nice atmosphere. There was a lot of very interesting, I, Avery Praiseman, David Bader, a lot of very, very good uh, artists and a, and a very exciting dynamic. So that, that sort of, you know, was a good place to have a kind of slow breakdown in because, you know, someone like Marlena, that's, you know, for mm. her, that's like, yeah, you know, go do it, you know, go fucking crazy, you know. So these were these sort of new parents I met who, you know, were, were, were sort of mm. going, yeah, 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 go for it. Mm. And um, I was incredibly lucky f for that. Mm. Th that. And so that, yeah. You mentioned the, uh, the studio in Belgium. And I, I always think this is such an incredible um, image. And it, it seems to be, a, a, I mean, actually, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about photography as well, because how you photograph the studio yeah. increasingly over... Um, the last few years really, really comes through. But it was, it was our, to be honest, it was actually mm. Amy who often did the photographs at the studio. I always felt frustrated by cameras and I, I, they, I felt like they always broke and they were really complicated, they were kind of like these fragile things. So Amy would often um, photograph the studio. I think this is Amy's photograph, mm. that's my sense. And um, you have to remember, be, back behind that really tall figure was Enrico David behind a curtain and uh, a guy called Mike Cook, a painter, in a studio like I me. Mean, you know, and the, the, this was a cruel, cruel time. And uh, photography became the only way you could kind of show mm. what was happening. Because a lot of this was destroyed. Almost all of it was destroyed. Absolutely everything. And it was a very cruel, very cold studio. I've never, never been colder in my entire life. And uh, and that was the sort of uh, that was like you know really walking through the mountains you know mm. that that was kind of you know and um, so the photographs became very important because the objects disappeared and in many ways the the studio was a as a thing as a kind of s s testament to mm. being alive became very important for me mm. you know because I I really used to like the way the studio would get set up, and I would mm. like the way you would have this kind of relationship to these things that you knew were doomed, you know, deep down in your heart. It was like, it was like they were great because they, it's like if you're with someone you know is going to die soon, you know, you really love them a, that bit more, you know. So the sculptures, it was kind of mm. like, yeah, you know, my mm. good friends kind of, there was this kind of atmosphere, and Belgium has that anyway. Mm. You know, Belgium is... It's not for nothing that, uh, you know, Rambo and Verlaine, that was the last weekend, was mm. in the Garden Hall in Brussels, mm. uh, which is, is still available for anyone who wants a lost weekend. You know, mm. Brussels is like, stay for longer than six months, you know, and you'll never leave. <laughs> yeah. So we were, we, were, we were that. So photography became important just for that reason, mm. just to, to show, hey, that's what's mm. happening. And... Um, and that was like the beginning of the end with Europe. Mm. You know, I lived in Belgium for seven years, but in the first week, you could pretty much see what was going to happen. What, did you feel there was a, a way out then? Yeah, that this dark happen? side of the moon, yeah. Mm. And it was like, uh, and uh, the more dark side of the moon it was, the more somewhere I was compulsed to it, as was Amy, as was, you know, whoever mm. we were with. Mm. So something in me, you know, was really fascinated by that mm. experience, you mm. know, and um, and being very reckless about, you know, our well-being and being very reckless about, you know, it was kind of a step back on one level and a step forward on another. 
in terms of uh, your social being or in terms of your financial security, it was a giant step back. Yeah. And in terms of engaging with the world, you know, at the end of the Italians, I started thinking, wow, you know, I'm going to have a show at the Tate soon. This is amazing. Mm. And uh, within a week in Belgium, I was like, fuck, you yeah. know, I'm in really Trill. deep trouble. Yeah. And, um, and something about that felt very real. I mean, uh, it was a very, very, very cruel art world out mm. there at that time, mm. you know. The it two, still is, of the, course. The but two pieces on, um, on the right here, the standing figure and, and the crouching figure, yeah. uh, seem to be the ones that uh, endure from that period of time. Yeah, because they were bought by um, a, a very discounted rate, I had by Xavier Hopkins, because I'd, start, I'd met Xavier through other artists at the Italians, and um, he knew he could possibly do a show of my work because he would like blacklist his gallery, you know, it was that bad. So, but he was. Uh, sweet enough, and I don't know what it is about Xavier. There's some sort of old school quality to Xavier, like one of those old dealers, mm. and he would buy, you know, the odd piece. I mean, not enough to survive. I mean, we mm. couldn't survive from it. But he would, and those. That's why those mm. works survive, you know. So in Aptiburg, for example, Suzanne Fitz really wanted the piece on the life yeah. system, and um, and that only really survived. Mm. Do, you, of that. do you find yourself coming back to these? I don't, I don't work, like these works really. at all. I mean, I really don't. They really disturb me. I, I want to get away, as far away from them as I can. And um, I don't know. I was, I was, uh, you know, I don't know what. It, I really don't know why. Why I was making them at all. I, I, I can only say that I have a very, let's say, uh, a lot of my memories and a lot of my ways of dealing with the world are, are transmitted through the body, mm. you know, and, uh, and memories of the body and, and, you know, these kind of things. And, uh, you yeah, know, because I didn't feel like I had an audience, I was able to make these pieces. And, um, and so I'm very uncomfortable with them having an audience, mm. let, let's say, mm. you know, because they weren't really for public consumption, in my opinion, they were, they were made... What, these works at this yeah, time? Yeah, they were sort of made for my own um, sort of understanding of, of you know, do you, do you, what uh, was happening to me. Do you think that's one of the biggest shifts in terms of what, over the last few years? Mm. You know, you're talking about the relentless exhibitions and what have you. Well, now I'm, 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 I'm on a different mission. You know, back then, if someone would have said, you know, should I become an artist, should I become a sculptor, I'd say, don't do it. You know, just don't do it. Do charity work, or mm. you know, do whatever it is to do something good for the world. I had very, and um, and now I'm on a different kind of mission. I think you know, I've realised that the only thing worth anything, pretty much, is uh, to be creative uh, in this lifetime. Mm. You know, so now I'm I'm singing a different song. You know, and uh, there's something about going to America really, you know, underlines that. Yeah. And in America, you got to shout loudly. You know, uh, mm. there's no whispering in the mm. States, you know. Mm. I mean, you've just seen the conventions. Did you see much subtlety there? I mean, America is like, mm. boom, you know. And, and so when I arrived in, in the States, it got so bad so quickly that, you know, you had to either say, I'm doing this and I'm 100% into it, or I'm not. Mm. And, and I decided to do 100%. And then I got very fascinated by the potential of... Mm of being an artist mm. and the importance of that and the importance of that space and mm. all of that stuff. Then, no, I was much mm. more, I was much more negative about, you know, I just made art because I didn't know what else to mm. do or something. That was kind of what I felt. I don't think that's the truth. I think I was working out, I think I was learning how to be an artist, mm. you know. And by, and by necessity, the studio is huge for you, isn't it? It's, it's, mm. it's a massive part of... Yeah, again, I came out of the expanded field, which was, you know, the studio was a, a fundamentally conservative, limiting place. I, I came more from, you know, a room of my own, sort of mm. Virginia Woolf thing of just if you could get some space to think freely, you know, without the world mm. hammering at you, and, um, and where you could, um, you know, find a philosophy and find a a way of being and find a routine of action. Mm. These things I really needed in a studio 
is such a, an amazing place if you're disenfranchised or if you feel, um, you know, it's, it's, it's such a position of strength. Mm. And every friend of mine, you know, from my generation, a lot of us returned back to the studio. I mean, randomly. I mean, this wasn't kind of, you know, I didn't convert anyone, but a lot of people I met along the way, if you remove the studio, it's like, you know, you're, you're taking, mm. you know, some fundamental right, you mm. know. A lot of my generation in LA certainly are like, we're almost like the NRA, you know, take our guns mm. away from, take our studios away from our cold hands or whatever. It's like the studio mm. is a place where you can, that's maybe a Gen X thing, mm. I don't know, it, where, where you could escape this relentless sense of something mm. I just couldn't relate to. But despite, I mean, that massive increase in scale, like, I mean, remember when I first came to oh, see the early no, studio? I mean, do you know how big... That sculpture is. Yeah, no, I'm, I don't mean the scale. I mean the scale of the complex of the studio that yeah. we have now. Mm -hmm. um, it feels as if the, the DNA hasn't changed at all. You know, even from the very first Ripple studio I came to four or five years back now. Right. The, the project, I had the idea of the project when I was about six, to be honest with you. I remember telling my mum, you know, I think this is what I'm going to do. Mm. I'm going to be, I think I should make this thing and it could look like this and that. And of course, you know, 1978 in, 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 in that place, there was just no way at all. But it's pretty much played out like I thought it would look like. And I never had that much choice about it. Mm. I was really, really interested in uh, reality, what mm. reality looks like. Mm. And I was interested in the way humans try to represent reality, let's say. Mm. And I liked to do it in this, in this way that included touch. And included um, and included physical interaction. Let's mm. say, I, so I could have. So, for example, for me, performance uh, made a lot of sense at that time. Mm. But uh, that's why, probably, mm. you know. But the idea was pretty much the same mm. going through. I mean, now in in Los Angeles, um, certainly with the new studios and stuff, it feels very. It's finally, I'd say, about. In the last year, I'm in a situation where I'm finally able to do what I want to do. So, uh, there was an interview the other day where someone said, you know, I guess I was synonymous with this idea of failure, some kind of heroic failure. I think I did talk a lot about, you know, failing and wanting to fail and da da da. But recently, I'm not so interested in that anymore. And I'd say the show, particularly in North Gallery, mm. of several row, is the first time I don't feel that that failed. Mm. And I need it you know, five mm. buildings and you have know, 20 mm. people and, to do that show. It's just mm. impossible without that help. Mm. So I'm sort of struck by that, uh, that reality, you know, which is that, you know, sculpture is a lot like making a movie. Mm. It's not, it's like, it, it's as far from painting as an activity as you can get, really. Uh, you need all these things. You need mm. all this, you need this crew. You need this, you know, just like making a movie without backers mm. without you know sound people mm. producers mm. you know it's very difficult you know, if you really want to make a film so I'm just about now at 40 able to make the sculptures I want to make just from a pure technical standpoint yeah. you know yeah, yeah. does that it's in I think when we started the conversation we spoke a little bit about um, what you were saying about finish that you couldn't finish these pieces of work yeah. and actually for me going around this shit is probably one of the most resolute Absolutely. presentations yeah. that I've seen of your work, to be quite frank. Yeah, I think that's uh, I, it's a, a really good point. I think because I was so, uh, it was so painful, so unbelievably painful um, to finish anything that um, when I did, I really, you know, slammed the ball mm. through the hoop kind of thing. I was like, you know, you are officially finished, you know, leave me alone. And the good thing about it was it went straight out of the mm. studio at the moment they were, but yeah, I, I mean, again, that's an, a, an English thing that's to do with it being in London, was um, I wanted to leave no room for the imagination. Uh, let's say I wanted to leave no doubts in, any, mm. in anybody's mind, mm. including my own, about you know my intent and mm. about where the pieces ended and finished and, and, and mm. what they were trying to do. Mm. So, yeah, it's a very... I, let's say I feel very grown up with the show, you know. I feel very sort of, um, oh, grown up's the wrong word. Uh, maybe I feel, 
clear about it. And I had to go through, maybe because I went through so much fog and mist mm. and, you know, it was a very difficult uh, sort of process. And we picked a lot, you know, I had, you know, I'd pick one of every five sculptures, something like that. Mm. Something like that. So it's a quite condensed mm. for me, you know. I always have a really hard time with when they, you know, people come, they look at your shows and they say, couldn't there have been less work or couldn't there have been more work? I never think like that. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it just has to, it's mm. a bit like, I don't know. I, I've never, ever, ever believed that my job was to make the show mm. easy for someone mm. to get, you know, or to, so they go, oh, actually, you know, I get it now, I mm. like it now. None of those things ever, mm. sort of ever, ever occurred to me. How important are the shows for you? Because remember when we worked on the, the Oxford show, yeah. And it almost felt as if you'd done the show in the studio six months before. Yeah, I had, In a yeah. way. And in just wonder, you know, in your head space, is that... Yeah. There, or there or were, is that space kind of condensing to the point at which it becomes this performance, this public performance? Ongoing? Well, I, I feel like I have the luck as a sculptor that I can do all my degenerate behaviour behind closed doors and then give it to someone and, and they have to, you know, it's this object. So mm -hmm. in Oxford, yeah, I was really, really clear about, uh, because the, the piece of the Whitney, you know, the, mm -hmm. the baby, I really made for the, for the UK. I didn't really make it for, for New York. So I was really thrilled, you know, that you, you were kind of like, well, let's try and get that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, in the case of, of Oxford, yeah, it was, I was really, uh, you know, I had models of the space. I set the pieces out. And uh, the same with House and Wolf. By by the end, I was pretty, you know, I was pretty aware of like, well, that will go there, that will mm. go there, that will go there. And at a certain moment, the activity, let's say the the performance of making the work, which it is without mm. a doubt, stops, and then another idea comes of, of you mm. know how you present it and, and what you're trying to say and mm. all of this. But in Oxford, yeah, I was pretty cool and calm in Oxford. Uh, that was, a was that you, cool and calm? Yes, it was. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was me, cool and calm. And I've been cool and calm since I arrived in London. But, um, but, but yeah, yeah. I, I, it was, it was, uh, it became evident as you went down the road that that was kind of the, sh the way the show was bound yeah. to be. Yeah. You know. But my, I think one of my overriding impressions from this show that we have here now is, um, I'm just flicking through these slides. Actually, you. It feels there's the early work, there's Red Man, there's Baby, there's Octopus Man. There yeah. are these moments of, of kind of a, not a completion, but just a, a, a settling with the work. Yeah. But it feels like this actual exhibition rather than the, just a one work itself. Yeah. Ha, has this resoluteness. Well, you're you obliged. I mean, if you're an artist, you're obliged to make exhibitions. Just like if you're a musician, you're obliged to make albums, you know. And uh, I agree with Brian Cousy with the idea that really the perfect show of your work occurs in the studio. You know, there's no doubt yeah. about that. And uh, the best moments I have with my own work and with my friends' work are often in their studios. You know, they're really amazing, the, the, the sort of relationship between the place where the things are made and thought about and them existing there is incredibly important. And so a show is a kind of necessary evil, in a sense. Again, I come out of a different... Mm. generation and the institutional critique people and all of that who really took you know the white cube and I, I admire all of that I think it's tremendous but I didn't come out of that mm. I came out of uh, where the show is a kind of necessary evil you know you have to you have to sort of let go of the pieces and you have to kind of uh, allow them to be in a space and you know and um, and I never think that that's the final resting point of the pieces, you know, a, a sculpture for me, you know, sh when it's good, should be able to exist in multiple contexts and multiple situations and multiple, uh, you know, lights, tensions, so social situations, all of that. Mm. So, you know, really good sculpture has a big relationship with time, I think, and um, and I'm interested <clears throat> in that kind of time. In the, and so that's what I mean about. Uh, a show doesn't feel like an ending point at all yeah. for me. It sort of feels like, well, that's where that kind of collided, and yeah. that's sort of interesting. But I never, I never, um, I, I never, uh, let's say, I never used photos of the shows 
as a way to describe my work, mm. for example. That, that, that's, for some reason, that's just not... And then people say, well, shouldn't you try and bring the studio to the gallery? And the, but that's, that's, no, that's, that's the studio is, yeah. Uh, just, yeah. Talking of time, we've been going for nearly an hour. Wow. Which is incredible. We've barely got started. We haven't even got like, started, have we? I'm, we, we haven't, haven't got there. haven't talked about my mother yet, or... I, I know, I've got it all written down here, but, um, <laughs> and then crossed out, but... Um, I know, it's all there. We haven't done mass on, we haven't done anything yet. Yeah, but anyway, mass on, we didn't know, do mass. We didn't do mass on. Um, and uh, Debbie's going to say we need to open up to the floor, I'm sure, at uh, 5 to 5. So Is it 5 to 5? Would you be, you're happy to answer some Absolutely, questions? Absolutely, if there's or? any. I'll answer anything at all. It can be to do with business, anything, you name it. Don't do Because I hate it when artists would do a talk and then you'd be like, how did you get in that gallery? They're like, I'd rather not talk about that. It's like, what? You know, tell me how you fucking got in that gallery. And uh, how did you live between 94 and 98? You know, I hate when... I, I will tell you anything. If you want to ask it. If you have Right, the there's an invitation. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, um, they're important. <laughs> yeah, they are. Well, they're uh, for me. That you know, the the the. Um, I'm a you know. I was brought up by women. I, I didn't really have any men in my life until I was, mm. God knows, I don't know how old I was, forty or something. Mm. And uh, and so I was brought up by very staunch northern feminists. You know, these very tough. Uh, my mother, you know. Had, three kids, four, five jobs, you know, all this mm. stuff. And uh, so, you know, the penis in the 1970s was a pretty, you know, yeah, you didn't bring it up a lot, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like, Mom, I've got a penis, <laughs> celebrate it. And, uh, and, um, and then the North does two things with the penis, you know, you know which I don't know if it's for public consumption, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's say the sexual drive in the north is like very intense and strange. So, so uh, these are also kind of dramatization. There's a lot of humor in them. There's a kind of strange humor in them. But um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're you know, um, I'm going through a phase of sort of, you know, I've got kids now and, and I'm sort of noticing, wow, mm. you know, my son has a penis, I have a penis. My daughter doesn't, you know, my wife doesn't, mm. you know, woof, you know, these kind of recognitions, which, yeah, speak to what <clears throat> we a childhood I had, but, you know, and, and, and the idea of will to power, you know, really, you know, it was a, it was a dirty word to have a will to power uh, as a man, as a white Anglo-Saxon man, was a really kind of dodgy thing, <clears throat> you know, it was, you might, you know, set something really bad going mm. with a phallic will to power and um, you know and, and I like I like mm. the weirdness of sort of delving into that and laughing at it and, mm. and liking you, it you've and done some really beautiful sculptures of women elegant sculptures in a way yeah and I, the reason I say it is because when, well, when I was just looking at the, um, <laughs> I don't think many people you know, I was looking at the, anim the animals and it was just yeah. and, but this gender thing it was, I think became an issue you know I don't know whether it's a uh, it, yeah. It's a male cat or a female cat. It's a well, it's just really interesting. Europeans cat. always, always ask me the gender of my sculptures, and Americans never do. Wouldn't touch it. Yeah. What is that? I, either they don't care, or they're repressed, or you know, I don't know, or something. But the sculptures always have multiple genders for me, and when I mean multiple, I mean they're men, they're women, they're transvestites, mm. they're. Uh, old, old dead people and the uh, pre-born people and all this. So the sexual quality of the sculptures isn't really man mm. or woman. I'm not really interested. It's not black and white at all. No. And, uh, you know, the, the, the women sculptures I make I, and the animals I take much more seriously. Mm. Let's say I, I get really, really intent about them in the studio for some reason because I want to do sort of like a good job with an owl or something like that. And um, so they, yeah, they, they the, the sexual impulse of my work is in the sort of squeezing of the clay. Mm. 
and the jumping around in the clay and the, uh, you know, or the, in the materials, you know, that there's a lot of, the sexuality occurs in the activity of mm. making it. Mm. And so the, the sculptures kind of, I think, if they have a sexual thing, it's more to do with that than what gender yeah. they have or whatever. Because making sculpture is highly sexual activity. There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, it's a bit like fighting also. It's, it's all these real, or dancing sometimes. Mm. And um, so that's much more, I think, where that plays in and where that's complicated. Mm. But, you know, my kids really have no problem with... It's been really interesting with, you know, the genders or the frightening quality of them or are they monsters or that... that They've kind of taught me that I was, you know, that was okay. That they, they're sort of pre that. And so, does that make sense? Just, we're we're going to start talking again. Mm. Over here. <clears throat> uh, the, there's fantastic work in Venice, I see. Um, the flat planes. Yeah. The flat planes uh, come actually from, that's interesting, they come from uh, the idea or the desire to put drawing um, in as fast as possible, to package drawing as fast as possible and make it a sculpture. So uh, just a quick sort of thing, you might see these boards on the floor. I have a lot of boards like this, but they're shiny white that, that don't absorb water. And I draw on the boards, I draw a shape, the shape of an arm or the shape of a leg. And then we pour a liquid plaster on top of the drawing. So we kind of print the drawings, let's say. Mm -hmm. And we strengthen. When you pour plaster, plaster is very vulnerable, it's very thin. So we strengthen it from the, from the top side. And then we pop the, the forms off the floor. And the idea why I started doing that was, yeah, if you make a drawing on a, on a sheet of paper and you've got a sculpture in front of you, you don't really want to waste the time making a thing and then you hoist it up on the sculpture and it's way too small or way too big. So I, I always did that process as a kind of jumping, jumping really quickly into uh, a sculptural form through a drawing. They're literally casts of drawings. So in the piece in Venice, um, I wanted to move back and forth between activities that took a long time, which is you know manipulating clay, casting it, breaking it out, going through this laborious process, and those pores, which you can make quite large form, like uh, 10 or 15 form very, very quickly, very cheaply within a day. So um, uh, with the piece for Venice, uh, that sculpture just, that, that just when, when, when we hoisted them up to have a look, you know, hey, will that work? They just worked, you know, and, and so I thought, so actually, the, the flat planes are mm -hmm. a kind of echo of a drawing. Mm -hmm. They were made very, very quickly, you know, in like no time at all. And that sculpture, I could have gotten really upset and freaked out, and like I was with Savile Row, but I decided not to be, you know, because it was for Venice, and I thought, you know, Venice Biennial, you know, I'm going to do something mm -hmm. horrible mm -hmm. for these people, you know. I, so those are feeling, I, I, you know, I don't, and uh, so, that, that's why those planes actually are, are drawn forms. They're like studies for the sculpture, but some every now and again they work together. And if you look at the new, the piece in South around the North is the brother or let's say the sister or the family member of that piece. And there again you get the breaking down much more. It's like the next step of the whole thing falling apart. Are there, are there pieces that are specifically plasters and there's pieces that are bronze or is yeah, that becoming... Yeah, the piece for Venice and the piece for Savile Row couldn't exist as plasters. They're just too, no. too dangerous. The um, baby, for instance. Baby can, is only yeah. plaster. Will only be plaster. Is only plaster, yeah. Because the mm. drawing on it is so important. Mm. Or let's say the print. Like those lines are printed. Like they're not drawn on it. They're like printed and they, they were really so... They, they speak so well in the piece, and so, um, and how they relate mm. to the lines of the iron, you know, if you look at the mm. iron in the drawing, uh, that 
It's the first time I really noticed that, like the, the, how you put structurally put something together is a form of drawing also, mm -hmm. and um, so that wouldn't be. But like the piece in the North Gallery, it couldn't exist as a as a plaster, and they had to like cut it into tiny tiny pieces to cast it. So you know it's kind of going to die. Rodin had the famous Clay's Life, Plaster Death, Bronze's Rebirth, and that there's real truth to that. If you're interested in sculpture. Mm -hmm. I don't think it works in any other mm. walk of life. Yeah. You know, it's not a good, it's not a great piece of advice. You know, when you're at your bank next time, well, did you know? Just, never gets me anywhere. Oh. Any other questions? Chris. Ah, Chris. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah, that was right. And and the um. Yes. Right. Absolutely. I um. There's a kind of uh. There's a kind of hip thing about. Or well, let's say there's a kind of way out sometimes if you bring the studio into the to gallery. It's a kind of, it's a bit like using in music, how could I, you good, good analogy. It's a bit like in movies using suddenly handheld. You know, ooh, it's more informal, mm. da, da, da. And, uh, and I always loved uh, windows. You know, we were installing and it was at night because we were obliged, you know, it took so long. So by the night, we were kind of starting to place pieces. And just the people walking by, you know, the drunk people walking by or the people coming back from dinner, you know, would, would lean on the window. You know, so there were a couple of nights where we really had, you know, 10 or 15 people, like, faces, you know. And I realized straight away, hey, I have to be really, you know, I have to really get the studio out of this room. And I have to really go, dum, 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 dum. And actually, I, uh, about four days, three days before the opening, it was a very full room. It was a very, and we pared it down, pared it down, pared it down, pared it down, to, to the point where I, 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 it really made me nervous. You know, it was like, gosh, you know, these are things you walk around and... Uh, they're going, to, they're going to really, without any kind of excuse, you know, boom, 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 boom. And I got a thrill out of that. I mean, just quite simply, in the last day, I thought, wow, okay, you know, that's going to be, they have to become objects, you know. And I like that idea of them becoming these objects that also had this theatrical mm. presence on the street. And it's a unique space. I've never known a gallery ever before where the world and your work just kind of blend in this strange way, you know. When they pull those blinds up, it's like, whoa, mm -hmm. there's the normal world and there's what I do. And I really liked that. I really liked being sort of super clear about that. And I really enjoyed that, that feeling of let's perhaps someone walking home from dinner would stop and look at that show. It's lit at night, you know, the lamp at the front actually lights the show and I think some of the if you go and see the show the most beautiful time we walked past it last night is I reckon at night around sort of midnight or something like that because all the shadows get thrown and oh yes very theatrical very very cinema but it's beautiful and it, and it you know it's there for for that experience let's say does that sort of but it but it's it's not uh but again it really the installation of the show was uh, it was clear quickly that we had to respond to the space in, in many ways, to, mm. to those windows in many ways. Mm. That, you know, it's really open, you know. It's like those dreams mm. where you are peeing and like a hundred people are looking at you. That, that in the show, it was quickly like, whoa, okay, it's going to be like that. Mm. You're very naked in that space. Mm. So, Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a much more utopic artist than, than, than uh, and I, um, I, 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 but that was going back to the, the, the depression period in Belgium and then let's say the utopic, let's build something feeling that I have in the United States, which is, yeah, I look at those, uh, at those references, I look at those positions and I'm, I'm very thrilled by them. I don't think we've understood the 20th century correctly. And I also don't think we've understood how the world looks. I think we all know that we don't believe in photos anymore, which is, let me ask you a question, post Iraq war, do you believe anything that anyone shows you that's a photograph or a film? Do you believe Mitt Romney is Mitt Romney from a photograph? I don't. Do you believe Paul Ryan is Paul Ryan from a photograph? So we've lost that belief in, in that, which was a great achievement in a way of the 20th century. And Chris, as you recall, at the end of the 90s, maybe photography and film had relegated, let's say, fine art making, painting being the great victim at that time, uh, to just the junkyard. You know, painting is dead. Do you remember? That was a big sort of rallying call. And we have the opposite now. Photography is dead, 100%. Film is, film is in trouble, you know. Sculpture is the most realistic thing you can look at if you want information. And so I, that's why, you know, if I sort of look, look at my references, I'm going much more to that. And I'm much more interested in reading what those people are saying, which is Kabuzi at the moment. I'm, it's interesting you bring that up. I'm absolutely enthralled to his, to his project, let's say. It feels unrealized still to me. I think a lot of strong, strong, strong ideas that you haven't been realized. Someone was just telling me they were going to do a Nauman show in LA of all the unrealized Los Angeles pieces. I didn't know there were so many unrealized Bruce Nauman pieces. You know, that's what I'm... That's what I'm... Exactly, yeah, I would. And I'm, uh, and I, I'm making a, a sculpture park sort of as we speak. But I also, uh, I, I'm, I'm, my next show will be a, 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 will be a sort of miniature city-state, yeah. But, you know, I, I, for, for a luxury uh, thing, because, you know, the idea is that, yeah. The, and that's where the studio will come more in, which is, you know... Um, and um, yeah, that's my dream. I, I'm really, by the way, thankful that you pick up on that. That's, and that's sort of the next step. So it's interesting you already feel that, which, which is, yeah, I'm very, very utopic. I think artists should be used to build things. I don't think any building should go up that an artist isn't involved in. I don't think any war should be taken on without artists talking about it. I don't think any uh, significant discussion about the environment should take place without artists being part of it because they're more likely to to create some kind of solution in my opinion I mean that extremely realistically very practically so that, that that's my feeling yeah <clears throat> Thank you very much.